Good morning. Beautiful to see you on this beautiful, crisp morning. In the first year of the reign of Joseph Biden, when Kate Brown was governor of Oregon and Jay Inslee, governor of Washington, while Ted Wheeler was mayor of Portland, during the high priesthood of Diana Akiyama, <laughs> while Nathan LaRude ruled over the Cathedral of Trinity, <laughs> the word of God came to a lowly priest of that cathedral, Matthew, son of Van, <laughs> while he sat in his apartment on a Monday evening watching Disney+. Plus. <laughs> this word of God reduced him to rapturous fulminations, which were later transcribed into English upon a MacBook Pro of recent vintage, <laughs> and which reads as follows, <clears throat> Yea, verily, be it hereby known among all citizens of this land that the new Beatles documentary by Peter Jackson is without a doubt the most important rock and roll documentary of all time and must be watched by all persons belonging to the generation known as Baby Boomer. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> if we are extremely lucky persons, we will have had a few rare moments in our lives when a spiritual light shines in our darkness, moments when wounds are healed and bitter memories are dispelled by a single flash of insight. Peter Jackson's six-hour Beatles documentary, Get Back, did that for me. Allow me to take you back to a cold winter night in Minnesota, February 9th, 1964, when I was a confused seven-year-old boy being rushed into our living room by my older siblings, all of whom were nearly jumping out of their skins in anticipation of the Beatles' first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. <laughs> My entire life changed at that moment. At the time, I could not have told you why, but years later, I came to see how the Beatles showed us boys a new, joyful way of being a man, how we could cheerfully snub our noses at an overwhelmingly conformist and lifeless culture, how we could joyfully embrace creativity and sexuality and romance and play while the rest of the world was telling us to be serious and repressed and obedient soldiers willing to die in Vietnam. The Beatles gave us a way to unleash mountains of repressed energy that could no longer be contained by our parents and our clergy and our politicians. And they showed us what we could do with it, which was to embrace it, to sing it, dance it, scream it at the top of our lungs. The Beatles, in other words, changed everything. From then on, my siblings and I spent hours strumming tennis rackets while listening to Beatles records. We grew our hair scandalously long, bought every record we could get our hands on. By the time I was a young teenager, I was a true believer in the age of peace and love which the Beatles inspired. I was convinced that the new age was dawning, that an irresistible force of goodness was at work in the world, and soon we would all be singing our way back to the garden. Of course, we all thought this was the first time in human history when masses of people were seized by a vision of peace and love, in large part because we had stopped going to church and stopped listening to the old Bible stories. We would have dismissed any preacher for daring to suggest that there was a similar spirit in the air around 100 years before Christ when a prophet we're calling Baruch stood before a crowd of true believers and sang out these words of hope. Take off the garment of your sorrow and affliction, O Jerusalem. Put on the robe of righteousness that comes from God, the diadem of glory. For God will show your splendor 
everywhere under heaven. It never occurred to us that the same faith in a coming new age was what inspired John the Baptist in our gospel reading this morning, who was singing from the same score as Isaiah and Amos and Jeremiah before him. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The word hope is way too small a word to describe this kind of history-making dream that seizes a people desperate for change. We call it an eschatological hope or an apocalyptic vision because it has to be that much bigger than the empires of darkness that we're seeking to be defeated. Whether we're poets languishing in exile in Babylon or guerrilla warriors running raids against Roman legions, or African Americans in Selma facing down fire hoses and truncheons, or hippies marching against the Vietnam War, every once in a while, a divinely inspired vision will seize a people with the thrilling idea that God is hearing their cries and accomplishing their liberation against all odds. If ever there was a time when I longed for that spirit to return, it is now. I am desperately longing for a miracle of history, praying like John the Baptist for the God of justice and peace to finally come to fix everything that is so very wrong with this sad old world. But the problem is, I'm too old for that now. I've seen what happened to Jerry Rubin, who went from leading the Yippies to making a fortune on Wall Street. What happened to Bill Clinton, who pulled strings to get out of the draft so he could one day become president and send hundreds of thousands of black men to prison in a phony war on drugs. I've seen what happened with the Arab Spring, what's happening to the democracy movement in Hong Kong, what is becoming of the climate accords. The shadow side has always been teaching us its lessons. Isaiah's dream of a Messiah turned into a harsh theocracy that violently repressed diversity. Baruch's dream was crushed by Rome. George Harrison came to hate Ashbury and was disgusted by what he saw. Martin and Malcolm and Bobby were killed, and then there was Altamont and Jimmy and Janice in the anti-war movement, lost steam, and then the Beatles broke up. <laughs> Which leads us back to the Beatles documentary that Peter Jackson just released. When the Beatles broke up in 1970, I felt the end of that grand eschatological dream. And the worst thing was, it wasn't as if they had been defeated on a battlefield, you know, or martyred on a cross. Their defeat, as I understood it, came as a result of petty infighting and overbearing egos and lawsuits that destroyed their art. It was the worst way for a movement to end not by a glorious, heroic sacrifice, but by petty, self-destructive animosities, by pride and greed and a breakdown in communication. And the movie Let It Be came out and confirmed this impression. There's Paul overbearing and scolding and John dismissive and sarcastic and increasingly remote and George and Ringo being sidelined and insulted to their faces. The whole energy was strained and small and unflattering and cast this enormous, sad shadow, not just over the Beatles, but over the whole marvelous dream that they had ignited. The forces of darkness, it seemed, had once again found a way to crush the dream. And now here we are, over 50 years later, and I can't tell you how much I miss the Beatles, because we are in a crisis of hope again. We're a lost people, 
I'm not hearing any clarion voice singing us into a movement. And if I did, I don't know if I would trust it. But now the stakes feel so much bigger. Nothing short of the fate of the earth seems to be at stake, and we know better than to believe the naive dreams of youth. So where do we turn? And then Peter Jackson's documentary comes out. And for me, anyway, a different kind of hope, a more grown-up hope, is revealed. It's not a hope in adolescent fantasies of divine rescue. It's not a dream of a magical age when the powers of darkness are once and for all defeated by the forces of light. No, this is a hope that is far more grounded and far more real. It's a story about how four disillusioned and drug-addled rock stars come together once again to capture lightning in a bottle and how they struggle over who's in charge and everyone's egos get bruised and George Harrison quits the band and everything seems lost. And then they're finally forced to confront the demons that have divided them and they retreat to a private home away from the cameras and over the course of a couple of days, they hashed out their differences, and in the process, they remember how much they love one another and what it was they were born to do, and they get back to writing and creating and laughing and working their butts off, and for two solid weeks, they are the Beatles again giving themselves over to their genius, all of them bringing ditties and riffs and half-imagined bits of sound into the studio and playing them over and over and over again until they hear a song that they had not heard before. And when that happens, they all perk up their ears and they begin to smile. And pretty soon, they're grooving and creating some of the best rock and roll music ever composed. This is why this film feels to me like a revelation, because it shows me what a grown-up hope actually looks like. Not an adolescent fantasy in which we're rescued by a miracle of history, but rather the painstaking work of talented adults who prove capable of putting aside petty grievances and fragile egos for the sake of their art where a tiny bit of emotional intelligence and an enormous commitment to something bigger than themselves makes all the difference. It's a story of how the music itself finds the musicians, of how the creative process lifts them all to new heights of collaboration. It's a story about how, in the end, it's not about a god of magical happy endings, but rather about a god of hard work and deep joy and humility in the creative process. Just so we hear John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness, promising a magical happy ending by means of a giant miracle, and we know how that ends. We know it ends in betrayal and ambition and in death on a cross. We're too old to believe even a divine baby whose birth will miraculously usher in a golden age of peace and justice. But we also know this, that that old song still sings, that when we gather in places like this to sing those old songs, something bigger than ourselves sings through us. And that song can lead us to put aside our petty differences and work together and create together, and love together, and find deep joy and meaning together. And maybe, just maybe, that's good enough. Amen.